When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Now, to make sense of this second half, the book of, of Nehemiah, we will shift from Israel and Ezra back to Persia with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a fascinating character. We meet him in the very first verse. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan at the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now here we see that Nehemiah is in a very different circumstance than Ezra. In the book of Ezra, we didn't meet him until halfway through. There had already been one round of remnant returning with Zerubbabel and Sheshbazar. And then the second group comes with Ezra as he reestablishes the law. The temple's now been completed, all is well, it seems, in Jerusalem. Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't even know, because I'm here, Nehemiah, in, in Shushan, in the palace. I've got a pretty good gig going on here among the Persians. We'll find out in a moment that he is the cupbearer of the king. And that puts him in a position of influence, of being in the know. Uh, his life's pretty good, but what he doesn't know is... Are the lives of the Israelites good as well? So I love the fact that he thinks not just of himself, and hey, I'm all good, so don't worry about it. No, when these messengers come, he asks them, how are the Jews back in Jerusalem? How did they fare? Here's a man who is concerned about his people more than himself. In verse 3, you see more of that. They said to him, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. In other words, the people are suffering physically. There's the affliction. They're suffering psychologically. There's the reproach. There's no wall to protect them. Talk about exposed to the world and its, its dangers. The, the loss of a sense of self, as we talked about, these walls before them. There's no gates, so that's the place of judgment. There's no sense of what should come in and what should go out. I mean, there's no walls to make a difference there anyway. This is no way to live. Yes, you can have a temple, but you've got to have the walls to separate the people of God from outside influence. So how's Nehemiah to react once he knew, receives that news? Verse 4, it came to pass when I heard these things that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now this isn't mourning over sin like Ezra was. This is mourning over circumstance. The situation they find themselves in, how can I not weep when I know that my own people are suffering? He was, that's beautiful empathy, by the way. He's feeling for them, even though he isn't there feeling with them. Like I said, my life's good here in the palace, but theirs isn't, and, and therefore, how can I not be moved with compassion toward them? As a result of that compassion, he fasted and prayed, it says, and here is his prayer. Verse 5, I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Notice what Nehemiah knows about God. He is great. He is terrible. In other words, awe-inspiring. We fear him slash revere him. He keeps covenant. He keeps his word. But he also keeps mercy since we don't always keep covenant and we don't always keep our word. A beautiful combination there that he can always be trusted including trusted to come through for us when we can't be trusted ourselves. There is his mercy, and it is given to those who love him and observe his commandments. Great combination there. If you love me, keep my commandments. We see the same combination in Nehemiah's prayer. 
In verse 6, he keeps praying, Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. So it's not only sorrow over circumstance. It is sorrow over sin. He realizes the people haven't been perfect, and he includes himself among their number. I love that. We have sinned. I don't seem to be suffering as a result. i got a cush life here in the palace. But the people are suffering, and so it might as well be me. Both I and my father's house have sinned. By the way, you'll see similar humility on Jacob's part in the Book of Mormon. Jacob was as good as they come. You don't see sin on his part, but he admits it. My favorite place to see it is in 2 Nephi 9.14 when he says about the wicked that we will have a perfect knowledge of all of our guilt and our uncleanness and our nakedness. While the righteous, he goes on, will have a perfect knowledge of their righteousness and their cleanliness and they will be clothed with the robes of righteousness. I remember years ago when I read that and focused on the pronouns and thought, Jacob, why are you including yourself on the wrong side? You don't, you're not among the wicked. But his humility put him there. I don't know if there's a verse with more humble pronouns than there with Jacob. But you see a similar statement here from Nehemiah. I'm on the wrong side, along with my family. In verse 7, we, that same inclusive pronoun, we have dealt very corruptly against thee. And have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. This is on us. It's our fault. So verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Now why would he want him to remember that? that that's the bad news. And it's already happened. Nor the northern tribes were scattered by Assyria. The southern kingdom was brought, dragged captive into Babylon. Don't remember that. Well, actually, yes, do. Remember that half because that means you will remember the other half, which is the good news. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather thee from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Oh, that place is the temple recently rebuilt in the book of Ezra. The place of gathering. And that's where God will gather us to. Now, do you understand why Nehemiah would want God to remember both halves of the covenant? Not just the bad news, but the good news too? That's the godly sorrow and the hope that comes once we've hit rock bottom. Yes, we will be scattered for our sins. We already have been. But that the same God who warned us about that has reassured us about this, that there will be a gathering someday. And that if we will repent and come unto him, then he will bring us back home to Jerusalem, to the temple, to the promised land. We can bank on that. Even if we've been cast out to the uttermost part of heaven, there is no place outside the redeeming reach of Jesus Christ. And no matter how far you've been scattered because of your sins, the same God who warned you away from those is reassuring you that rebuilding lies ahead. You maybe didn't take his warning in the first half. Please take his promise in the second. Nehemiah does. He then says in verse 10, Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Such beautiful, possessive pronouns. He got the I and the we right earlier. He definitely gets the thee and the thou right here. God, we know thou art personally involved in all of this, because we're thy servants, we're thy people. Thou hast redeemed us, and we're grateful for thy personal involvement in all of this. 
No wonder he can pray in verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Speaking of the king. For I was the king's cup bearer. That's the first time Nehemiah has said anything about himself. And it didn't come until the very end of this chapter. Like I said at the very beginning, he's a guy who doesn't think about himself in his circumstance. He's thinking about others all the time. And, but here he, he realizes something about himself. Wait, I'm in a position of influence. I am the king's cup bearer. And if, oh, if I can somehow influence him to bless my people, then I can be an instrument in the hands of God. I'm just going to need God's hands upon me to help me through this. I'm not praying for, for the king of Persia to solve all of our problems. I'm simply praying that God will soften his heart to give me permission to help solve some of those problems more directly. In a way, this is like Nephi praying to God, I don't need you to build the ship. I don't even need you to build the, the tools for me to build the ship. But I could use a little help discovering the ore. If you'll show me where ore is found, I'll do all the work from there. Nehemiah seems to have the similar combination of faith and works. I'll do the work, but I have the faith first for you to soften the heart of the person I need to work through in this. And so he does. Chapter 2 begins, It came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer, after all. I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. And that's despite being a servant in a foreign land. Now, that might mean he was sad, but only in the king's absence. Either way, this is the first time the king's ever seen a bad, uh, a bad face on Nehemiah. And he says to him, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Well, then I was very sore afraid. Now, there's not many places you can look for mental illness in the Old Testament. But this might be one place where we can gain an insight into it. Because what's interesting here is the way the king responds to the sorrow of Nehemiah. He's never seen this before. But there's some change of countenance. He's got a frown instead of a smile. And <clears throat> can you blame him? Like I said, I'm a, a servant in foreign territory. But no, you've always had a good attitude. Your life's pretty good. We treat you well. My cupbearer, that's not too difficult for you. But his response is fascinating. What, why are you sad when you're not sick? <laughs> this is just sorrow of heart, so get over it. Now, do you see why I would mention this in a, in a few moments discussion of mental health? If someone is sorrowful, if someone is depressed, to use that word, Yes, we usually look for cause behind that effect. We look for environmental factors. Are you sick? It's like a baby when they're crying. Oh, they must be hungry, so let's feed them. They must have a dirty diaper, so let's change them. They must be overtired, let's help them fall asleep. And if nothing works, it's like, what is wrong here? I've exhausted all the options. Well, what if it's not something outside and not even something inside as far as physical pain is concerned or, or physical sickness? What if it's something unseen and sometimes unidentified. I just, I want to caution anyone who's never struggled with mental illness themselves. Be very careful before you look at someone and say, what are you sad for? You're not sick. You're not suffering. In other words, you have no reason to feel this way. That's the way the king says it. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Is that what we say? with people that are suffering from clinical depression? Eh, it's, just, it's, nothing, it's just in your head, so get over it. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And if we treat mental illness as if it were nothing, well, this is just, what, what anxiety? What's that? So you're nervous about something. We all get nervous, just get over it. Uh, there's a difference between your anxiety, lowercase a, and my anxiety, capital A. That just doesn't go away, and there's no cause for it, and I can't. I can't just get over it. There's a difference between your lowercase d depression, which, yeah, situational sorrow, and my capital D depression that never goes away. 
And if you treat it as if it were nothing, and you just wave it away like it's just a figment of your imagination, then no wonder it says that Nehemiah was very sore afraid. And so will be those people that you don't understand. They will be afraid of your judgment. They'll be afraid of your lack of understanding. They'll be afraid of ever opening up to you about what's happening in their mind and heart. They'll be afraid that there's no one out there to help them if things get to a breaking point where there seems to be no way out of this so-called nothingness, simple sorrow of heart. No, I may not be sick visibly or physically. But I'm sick mentally, and I don't know how to fix myself. It's so hard when the part that is broken is the part you're supposed to use to fix things. That's really frustrating. And as I've spoken with loved ones that are wrestling with this, as I've tried to communicate with loved ones through the mind, when it's the mind that is making things so difficult, no wonder solutions seem to be so hard to come by. But in the absence of simple solutions, we can at least empathize. We can at least cut people some slack and give them some space to sorrow and realize that it's not nothing else but sorrow of heart. There's something deeper going on. We can treat them in a way that they don't have to fear us, and we can be safe conversation partners. We can be safe shoulders to cry on, and that can make a great difference. In verse 3, he says to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Interesting the way Nehemiah responds to the king here. Because he was afraid of the king's response. If I, what am I going to say? And I love how he handles it. He simply says, here's my circumstance, and then I'll let you judge. Why shouldn't my countenance be sad? This is what's going on back in Jerusalem. This is my connection to it. This is what... Here are my walls before you, and it's a lack of walls for my, for my city. How do you think I should react to this circumstance? And I think that's a powerful way of advocating with our, for ourselves without oh, guilting the other party, without making it their problem, but not fully making it our own either. I, I, to me, there's something here, if you're struggling with mental illness, worth wrestling with, of just, here's the situation, how would you react? And leaving it at that. In verse 4 and 5, then the king responds, For what dost thou make request? He's, he's learning here. He doesn't try to solve Nehemiah's problem himself, but he asks Nehemiah, what would help you? I think that's really good advice to follow. I can't take away your mental illness. I can't solve every problem, but is, is there, do you see a solution at all? What do you think would be helpful? Because too often we come rushing in and we're like, well, this is the easy way to fix it. You don't know what I'm dealing with, and that doesn't work for me. Oh, I'm so sorry. What, you tell me what might work, and anything I can do along those lines to help, I'm here for. Now, this is exactly what Nehemiah needs to hear, but he's got a huge request to make, and he needs some divine help to make it. So, I prayed to the God of heaven. Notice he looked up to God before he looks over to the king. But with that extra inf infusion of divine help, I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. Again, I'm not asking you to build it yourself. I'm just asking you to give me permission to go do it. There is so much work to be done in my hometown, and I can't do it from here. I've received reports of what's going on there, and... Even if a temple is rebuilt, if there's no walls to keep the city in, uh, safe, if there's no walls to define the city and the people who live there, then I still have no people. I have a purpose, but not an identity. I've got a temple, but no wall. And 
I just want to make a, a contribution. I want to make a difference. Will you allow me to? And verse 6, the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, well, for how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. I actually really respect the interaction here between the king and his cupbearer. I mean, it started a little iffy when the king was dismissive as far as, as, far as Nehemiah's sadness was concerned. But it's ending beautifully. When it's like, oh, okay, I can't, I, I think Nehemiah did a good job first of here's my circumstance, I'll let you judge. And then it's starting to dawn on the king, like, oh, wow, he's got a lot on his mind. He's dealing with a lot. Okay, um, I'm not going to offer any solutions, but I can offer help for any solutions you might come up with. How can I be of service to you? And then Nehemiah seeks the Lord's guidance on this and the Lord's strength. And then he asks, but doesn't force it upon him. Uh, he's, if this is something you can do, if, if, I, if I've been worthy of any assistance, then this would make a great difference. And I'm not asking you to solve all my problems, but carve out some space where I can work through them. Oh, okay, I can do that. But notice it's not a blank check like we saw with Ezra as far as the finances and so on are concerned to build the temple. Instead, it's, okay, how long will you need? And then, and when will you return? And, and that's enough for Nehemiah because he sets a time limit for himself and says, okay, I think this is what I'll need. It's like budgeting. I don't need a blank check, uh, but this is how much I would need to accomplish the work. Oh, well, wonderful. Then let us meet those needs. Honestly, this is a great example of parenting. If there's a child that is pushing against the boundaries, because it's not just the king, the queen is right beside him. That's good. So make sure that you're united on this, mom and dad. And if a child is pushing the envelope, well, ask them how much more wiggle room they need. What are you asking for? What are your needs? And where do you, what do you think curfew should be? Or how much time do you think you'll need to accomplish this task that the family needs you to accomplish? How much extra space would make a difference for you? and work together to come up with a solution. I love the way this verse unfolds. And sure enough, Nehemiah is able to create a certain boundary. I mean, he is the, the wall builder after all. Here's how much space I need. Here's how much time. And he sets his own limit, which the king and queen can then honor. That sounds good. We've come to an agreement here. Work within those confines. They're a little broader than what I had pictured, but probably a little less than what you would have hoped uh, if you had a blank, you didn't get the blank check. So yeah, we can, we can both live with this. Well, just to make sure that others can live with it, Nehemiah then asks for letters from the king to certify all that's been said. I, I need proof. Maybe he's, I mean, this is the opposite of what we saw in, in Ezra, where letters are passing back and forth to the king, like, the, the Jews are up to no good here in this wicked, rebellious city. And it's like, oh, well, do, well check your sources a, a second time and you'll see what's going on. Well, here, Nehemiah, can I have your royal signature, proving that I have your permission for what it is that I'm trying to do? And in verse 8, the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Nehemiah is honoring God in this, even more than he's honoring the king. He didn't say, oh yeah, and the king just had a good heart in the right place. No, God softened that heart, and I praise God for it. Nehemiah eventually arrives in Jerusalem. He's got a royal escort, but he meets enemies when he first arrives. We met those back in Ezra as well, trying to, to get in the way of the work. In verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. It's sad that these two men, Sanballat, he's called a Horonite, but that is part of the Samaritans, and then Tobiah was an Ammonite. These are people that have connections to Israel. Ammonites, that's descendants of Lot. He should have been a little more loyal to Abraham's posterity. And like we saw with the Assyrian conquests, Samaritans are still half Israelite themselves, or at least some portion. But no, they're getting in the way of the work, and it grieved them to see that anyone was coming around to help. That's sick and twisted. When you're so low that 
not only are you not wanting to help others yourself, but you get frustrated or sad that anyone else is trying to help them. Remember charity rejoiceth not in iniquity? Well, these people have no charity. They can't rejoice that someone else is receiving help. In verse 12 and 13, I arose in the night. After all, Nehemiah is aware of the opposition that's out there, so I don't want them to see what I'm up to. I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. He's keeping the, the cards close to the vest on this one. But God has put something in his heart. I've come to help. And what's he doing this night? I went out by night and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Yes, I got the report from those messengers back at the beginning of chapter 1, but I've got to see for myself, because God has put this in my heart. He's not waiting for an engraven invitation, though he got one from the king. He wasn't waiting for a formal responsibility or calling. No, he just was moved by the Spirit, and he's acting on it. And he's getting up early or staying up late. He's losing sleep over this issue. He's doing it in a way to try to avoid opposition. And he's surveying just how much work will need to be done. Did I ask the king for enough time here? Well, he doesn't tell the people his plans yet. But he finally says to them in verse 17, Ye see the distress that we are in. Look around, my friends. Recognize our situation how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Oh, great passage there. Help people see the situation for what it is. Help them see that there is a better solution out there. Help them see that God is behind it and that they are willing to participate and, and people will roll up their sleeves and come running. So often we don't look for solutions because we haven't recognized the problem. But once we do, we're going to need help with a solution. And, and Nehemiah is offering all of this. No wonder they rise up ready to build. No wonder they strengthen their hands for the good work. In verse 19, but, the, back to the opposition, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian, we added another in the mix, when they heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Now, of course they weren't rebelling against the king. And he had the letter to prove it, whether or not these enemies knew anything about that yet. But it's interesting, they didn't... Well, how were they trying to oppose the work? This wasn't physical persecution. This wasn't standing in their way directly. Instead, they laughed and mocked. What was the main approach of the people in the great and spacious building against the people that had come to the tree of life and partaken of its fruit? They didn't try to create some kind of drawbridge over the filthy water to be able to go and charge the tree themselves. No, they, they were stuck on their side of things. And they couldn't force anyone away from the tree. Instead, they had to talk them out of it. Or more accurately, they had to mock them away from the love of God. They had to point the finger of scorn such that the responsibility shifted to the people at the tree and they were the ones that decided to drop the fruit and wander off into forbidden roads. That's amazing. Because we live in a day of religious freedom, or so they say, right? We've got to keep working for that. A time where physical persecution, hope for the most part, we've tended to outgrow. What are, what are people left with? In fact, even in the realm of religion, where proving and disproving are kind of outside the, the realm of possibility, since these are matters of faith, what are we left with? We're left with words, which is why I study anti-religious rhetoric. But more than that, specifically what's driven most of my graduate work study was ridicule. When I started studying anti-religion, 
I was blown away with how much of it is the pointing fingers, the mockery, the scorn, just the laughter as leverage to get people to drop religion themselves since they can't forcibly take it from us. It's amazing how often that happens. Ridicule is often all that's needed because there is a psychological aspect to it. You just feel so ashamed when people are laughing at you. And there's a sociological aspect to it because it seems like everyone is against you and, and you're in the pillory, you're on the post, and you're ashamed of these things. You want to talk about shame culture, that's laughter, that's scorn, that's ridicule. Uh, one of the earliest theories that tried to define why people laughed was called the superiority theory. And it was all about laughter as a sense of superiority you could use against someone that you were demeaning by your laughter. Uh, Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan called it sudden glory. As you get to glory over someone that you have ridiculed, you have reduced to the absurd. Some superiority theorists have even said that uh, human evolution is such that, that a smile of laughter is, is bearing the fangs and you're trying to bite into the person that you're laughing at. Oh, I mean, it's... It, that doesn't explain every instance of laughter. There is incongruity theory and, and relief theory and all these other kinds of theories out there too, but the superiority theory is the oldest of the bunch. And it's true when it comes to weaponized ridicule. As I try to sharpen my jabs and my, and my jibes, if I can laugh at someone and make you feel like an idiot for believing what you do, has that ever happened to you? Has that, anyone ever said anything or or made you feel less than others because of your belief? And has humor ever been used to do it? I mean, that's what the Book of Mormon musical was all about. That's what so much of early anti-Book of Mormon material was. Just let's make it a laughing stock. And the most successful people to ever take on the Bible and try to destroy it were not just secular hum humanists, they were secular humorists. And you see a Thomas Paine ridiculing the Bible. You see a, a Mark Twain doing the same in his uh, incomparable way. You see Robert Ingersoll doing that. You see it even more recently, uh, Richard Dawkins was speaking at a Reason rally in Washington, D.C., and he told the people there, the secular humanists that he was trying to rally, we have to laugh Christianity out of existence. We need to mock them into the corners of society where they can make no difference. Well, that's exactly what these people are trying to do. I have learned through my years of study, if someone is just joking, mocking, scorning, ridiculing, my red flags go up and go, ah, they must not have a better argument. They must be trying to use smoke and mirrors to try to shame me out of something that does have legs to stand on. And maybe it's their arguments that don't. Be, be careful when someone is trying to leverage laughter against you. Well, verse 20, Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. You see his faith getting him through that ridicule? Therefore we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Oh, the mockery didn't work on Nehemiah. He didn't drop the fruit and come over to the great and spacious building, oh no. And he even told them across the river, you've got no right over here. You have no portion here. You have no memorial here. You'll never be remembered like the people of God will be. And so despite your efforts at demeaning and debasing us, we will arise. Despite your efforts at tearing us down through your mockery, we are here to build up the walls of Jerusalem. And so I see through your ridicule, and it has no influence on me. There's power there. And so Nehemiah chapter 3, let's do this. Let's rebuild the walls. In verse 1 and 2, Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. Now wait, 
first people that we meet that are out building city walls aren't masons and, and carpenters. They're a bunch of priests. And the high priest is the first one on the list. Well, that's a good sign. Uh, we're totally engaged. We're ready to get to do this. So um, you might have to explain how, how stone cutting works. Never done that before. Uh, I'm really good at flaying animal sacrifice, but um, if you could help me with hammer and nails, I could really appreciate it. I love that in this chapter, you're going to meet people that probably have never been engaged in wall construction in their lives. In fact, later on, he'll mention goldsmiths in verse 8 and 32, apothecaries in verse 8, more priests in 22 and 28, and merchants in verse 32. Uh, yes, I'm sure there are some that have the necessary skill set, but the others, hey, I'm all about on-the-job training. I just know the work needs to be done, and I'm a willing, a willing participant. I know the goal, and I want to get there. So can you please teach me how? And these priests are the first to, to volunteer. They go and are building the sheep gate, and they sanctified it. That's something that they're probably better at. That's more up their professional alley. And then they set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mea, they sanctified it, unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zakur the son of Imri, and thus proceeds the rest of this chapter, basically. This is another one that's worth reading, just to be shocked by the names that you don't recognize. Which again tells us that the work is typically done by the no-namers of the kingdom of God. Just ordinary, everyday saints that serve in callings and give talks in sacrament meeting and go to the temple and, and pay their tithes and fast offerings and serve missions and do anything that the Lord asks of them. It's amazing the volunteerism in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't have to get a big name from it. Just put me to work. And that's what's happening here. Now, notice the phrase that was used several times in where we finished in verse 2. Next, so here's this guy working. And next to him, there's these people working. And next to them are these people working. That phrase comes up over and over and over again. Which is why this chapter always makes me think of Elder Uchtdorf's famous phrase, lift where you stand. And look to your left and look to your right, and there will be others next unto you who are lifting where they stand too. In fact, you'll get shuffled around constantly as callings come and go. And you'll be lifting in all kinds of places because you'll be standing all over the place. And you'll be associating with people next unto you throughout your life of discipleship, getting to know fellow servants anywhere along the wall. I love that part of the kingdom. And some of the best blessings I've received through my service have been the relationships I've developed with fellow servants right alongside me, working on the wall. Now, we could almost end our study of chapter 3 with that, because that's going to carry us through with person next to person, next to person, next to person. But let me just hi highlight a few other details through the midst of it that might give us a, a few insights. In verse 5, for example, Next unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Ah, the nobles... Now, the priests were ready to roll up their sleeves and get at it, but the nobles, ah, that's beneath us. Do I really have to put my neck out to do the work of the Lord? We saw in Ezra, who was most to blame for marriage outside the covenant? Well, the nobles. And so often it's the prideful who think that commandments are beneath them. They apply to everyone else. Or surely there are other people that are low enough to go work on wall construction, but me? I, dirt under my fingernails? Are you kidding me? I, I have servants to even clean out what little gets in there, but to be a servant myself? Of course not. That uh, is a, another place where I love the lay ministry organizational model of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The fact that a stake president today can become a uh, teachers or deacons quorum advisor tomorrow. And a bishop today can be in the nursery the day after the, he's released. Often they want that. Uh, a different, different group that they're working with. But to see people willing to go help people move and to go weed the church welfare farm, 
that no work of the Lord is beneath the people of God because they're the servants of God and they know where they stand. In verse 12, how's this detail? Next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. I love that detail because most of the names that you see mentioned in this list are male names. Here you have obvious evidence that men and women are working side by side in the work of the Lord. He and his daughters are repairing their portion. In verse 21, after him repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz, another piece. And that phrase, another piece, shows up in verse 24 and 27 and verse 30. And what it's referring to, I had to check the names on this one to, double, to be sure, but it would be people that were assigned a portion of the wall, and then later in the, the chapter it says, oh, and this same person was now assigned another piece. And these people that had a, a section back in verse 17 now have another section in verse 30, or whatever the verses might be. And that's a great insight too, that just because you finished your portion doesn't mean the work is finished as a whole. So if there's other parts that are still waiting, I remember we only had 42,000 that came first to help build the temple. I don't know what numbers we're up to now, but the, a wall around the entire city? Talk about all hands on deck. Male, female, uh, goldsmiths and apothecaries and, and merchants and everyone else. We need you. And in places where there aren't enough, if you finish yours first, go pick up somebody else's slack. Go do another piece. And that seems to be the mentality of most of the Lord's righteous servants in the latter days, too. This is such a great chapter to see ourselves in. And like I said, uh, we're not going to see ourselves by, by memorable names. You ever heard of Meramoth or Meshulam? Me neither. You ever heard of Hatush or Hashub or Hanun? Yeah, I've never met anybody that has that biblical name. But those were the people who built, who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, who gave shape and form and definition to the holy city, even though nobody knows their names anymore. Well, chapter 4, yes, there will still be opposition. We could have mentioned this back in our rebuilding of the temple in Ezra. Might as well mention it here with the rebuilding of the wall. Remember what Brigham Young said? That whenever we decide to build a temple, the bells of hell begin to ring. It's red alert downstairs because of all that's happening here to bring us to heaven. Well, the bells of hell rang against Ezra. And the bells of hell rang against Zerubbabel. And the bells of hell are definitely ringing against Nehemiah as well. And there often seems to be a Samaritan that's pulling the, <laughs> the cord. Former members that are raising the opposition, half Israelites in this case. So chapter 4, verse 1, But it came to pass that when Sanballat, that Samaritan leader again, when he heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. You'd think that if you're wroth, uh, if you got in, so indignant, you do something a little more physical than just pointing a finger and laughing. But the irony is, that's all he can do. They can't put a forcible stop to God's work. That's why they're trying to get us to stop it ourselves. That's why they're planting seeds of doubt or seeds of shame. Oh, the church isn't really true. In fact, the church isn't even good. Just laugh it off and get over it. That's even where the laughter of incongruity comes in, of like, oh, how can this be true and that be true? And let's make fun of this to make it look like it's totally irrational to believe anything. That's where the laughter of relief comes, because it's kind of a comic relief when you can just vent this inner turmoil or fear and just, if I can laugh at religion, then it is easier to, to walk away from it. Oh, there's so much work that ridicule is doing but again, that's all they can do. Do you remember what Nephi said about how they countered the people in the great and spacious building? But we heeded them not. That's it. There wasn't some massive counteroffensive on their part. They just ignored the laughter. Huh. 
Must be, I don't know, maybe there's a, a stand-up comic over there. I don't know what all the laughter is about. It certainly can't be us because we're, we're not doing anything irrational. We might be doing some things that are non-rational, but that just means they're above reason. It's the divine. It's the miraculous. That's, that is non-rational, but it sure isn't irrational. There's a difference there. But let's see an example of their mockery, shall we? Verse 2, he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria. Notice he's got an army, but he's not in a position to use it. Let's just oh, throw volleys of ridicule instead. But this is what he said. What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, so let me pick up where you left off, oh, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. The, can you hear the laughter? Can you hear the mockery come? In some ways, this is, oh, what was his name, Rab Shaka, uh, one of the generals of the Assyrians that was mocking the Israelites at the walls when Hezekiah was in charge. And he said, don't answer them a, don't answer them a thing. Just ignore, heed them not. Well, here, these enemies, notice what they're making fun of. They're mocking the, the Jews in Jerusalem as weak. You're feeble. They're mocking them as trying to establish some kind of boundary or fortification. <laughs> mocking their efforts at living a different lifestyle. That happens against us all the time. Mocking their sacrifice, their forms of worship. That makes no sense. What a total waste in there. Mocking their, their timing. You really think you can do this in a day? Well, that's an exaggeration. No, of course not. We can't do it in a day. But you'll be amazed at how few days we'll actually need once we all lift where we stand. Hold out for that one. Will you revive the stones out of these he this heap of rubbish? Notice what they're considering the wall. A snow wall, that's a, a junk pile. It's a heap of rubbish, and you really think that's going to do anything for you. The way you're living, these so-called sacrifices you're making, they are meaningless. They are laughable. Why do you think you're a laughing stock? Or as the Ammonite pipes in, <laughs> a fox could knock that all over if it wandered by. Just kind of swipe its tail, and your whole wall's going to come tumbling down. All your efforts are worthless. They're worse than worthless. They are absurd. You feeling tempted to leave yet? Well, Nehemiah continues to pray as a result. He never turns away out of shame. He simply turns upward to God in faith. He does it again here in verse 4. He prays, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Can you hear their laughter too? If so, then turn their repro reproach upon their own head. We'll see who laughs last. And give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. This is a pretty good equivalent of what the Lord said to Moroni when he was afraid of getting laughed at because of his weakness in writing. When the Lord says, mockery, sure, it'll happen. But fools mock, but they shall mourn. That's what's going to happen as a result of Nehemiah's prayer. It's, that, that sarcasm will turn to sorrow. That mockery will turn to mourning. The reproach will come back on their own heads. Because they won't be covered. Remember, that's the word for atonement. Their sins won't be blotted out. They'll be there for all to see. And here we are. 2,000 plus years later, still seeing their iniquity. In verse 6, So we built the wall, despite all of their efforts to dissuade us. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. I mean, they had the strength to work, but they had the mind to keep through it. And so often, especially when it's, it's mental opposition, it's rhetoric, it's persuasion, it's half-truths, it's mockery and slander. It's going to take mental strength to push through that. 
It's going to take some thinking through and looking for the rest of the story to contextualize messy parts of church history. It's going to take some thoughts to realize, wait a minute, they're just laugh laughing and there's no actual point to what they're saying. And so <laughs> you don't have a leg to stand on. And you, I can see through that now. Uh, you have to have a mind to heed them not and to just put the head down and push forward. And they had that kind of mind. They were focused. They were intentional. They served God with all their heart and might and strength, but also with all their mind. And that's important. We have to think about what we're doing here. In verse 7, when Israel's enemies heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, despite all their efforts to dissuade them, that the breaches began to be stopped. Uh-oh, no, all these spots on the wall are starting to fill in. And the, oh, those people that did a second portion, darn it, it's, it's working. Then they were very wroth. And they conspired, all of them together, to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Now the bells of hell are really starting to ring. And words were insufficient. They even got through our laughter, darn it. Well, maybe this army of Samaritans is going to have to come to the rescue. And let's conspire. Let's come together and figure out how can we assemble against them and fight. But good luck stopping the work. Remember what the Doctrine and Covenant says about man's puny arm trying to turn back the Missouri River. Well... The, if you thought laughter was puny, the, the arms are going to be pretty puny here too. Because verse 9, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Fine, they're going to come with their armies. Well, well, we'll keep a watch for them. We'll have watchmen on the tower. There's our prophets. We'll have watchmen on the walls. There's all of us that are ready to come to the rescue. Come fight. Prayer and watch come together in verse 9. You see them come together in Alma 34, verse 39 also. Listen to this verse. Yea, I also exhort you, my brethren, that ye be watchful unto prayer continually, that ye may not be led away by the temptations of the devil. Uh, what I love about that phrase, watchful unto prayer, or as we saw in Nehemiah, here's our prayer, and we're going to set a watch, is it makes me think of praying with one eye open. When we pray, we close our eyes. Then how can I be watchful? Well, if I'm praying and watching, am I, am I praying like this? Am I folding only one arm so that my other hand is ready to go fight and defend myself? Oh, there's faith and works combined here. And, and they are praying with one eye open. You'll see that described more in the next few verses. Verse 10, Judah said, so the people there, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. Uh-oh, the, the workers are spent. This is exhausting. There is much rubbish. Do you have any idea how much debris we have to clear away from the, destro the destruction of Jerusalem the first time? And as a result, they continue, we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, not till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Now verse 10 through 12, which I just shared, that's, that's a problem. It says that Judah said that. Now that's not all, not all Judah. There's plenty of righteous people whose names we don't know <laughs> that we saw in the previous chapter. Working side by side, lifting where they stand. But there are others that are being affected by the mockery. Remember in Lehi's dream, some heard it and, and heeded it not, but others heard it and fell away. And so it's, some of these negative efforts are working. Some people are complaining about the, the work. It's been too exhausting. About what they're up against, there's all this debris. And, but I do wonder, are those just excuses? I know it's tiring. I know there's a lot of work, but if we're strong in the Lord, we can do it. I think their last line was the real one. Our adversaries have said, we're going to come when you're not looking. Well, I guess that's why we're, we're, we're always looking. That's why we're being watchful as well as prayerful. Uh, but they said it ten times. Okay. And is it working? Is repetition all that's needed to wear you down? Gradually convincing you with their threats and with their doubts? I mean, if you hear enough things... 
That's the power of the CES letter, after all. I mean, it's just so dang long, and there's so many issues that, I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire, and I, I mean, I call it death by a million pinpricks, to be honest. And none of them will kill you, but collectively, if you don't get any help, you can bleed out the victim. And, and when you read it all at one fell swoop, and it's just overwhelming, and all the decontextualized things and the false premises that lead to false conclusions and everything else that's in there. Oh, 10 times worth. Uh, they're going to beat us. And, and so I've got to stop the work already. And they leave. Well, not everyone's that way, thankfully. In verse 13, Therefore set I in the lower places, behind the wall, and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. I mean, Nehemiah is channeling his inner Captain Moroni, and he's got his title of liberty right there, waving in the breeze. Do this for your families. Your brethren, your sons and daughters, keep the faith for their sake. Rebuild the wall. Hold on to your true identity. Keep the world out. Heed not the mocking scorns of your enemies. Because there's people writing on, on this. There's people confiding in you. Hold on to your faith for their sake. They need you. Do it after your family. I love that phrase. Whether you're high or low, wherever you are on the wall, get armed and put on the whole armor of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. And if you'll do that as a family, family scripture study, family discussions, family faith, family fortitude, then you will be blessing people up and down the lines as you cry out to those alongside you, fear not, remember God, and fight. I love these passages. In verse 10, it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us. Of course, we're hearing their, their plans. And God had brought their counsel to naught. It didn't work. We saw through it all. That we returned all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. <laughs> we only paused for a little bit to talk about this and reassure people. And then we were right back at it. Your efforts totally fell flat. They came to naught because of the power of God. I love that this thought of, you, you were hoping to intimidate us. You were threatening us with the army. I don't know if you were ever going to plan to use it. Do you even have one? Uh, no wonder you're resorting to ridicule and nothing more. But to see... I'll put it this way. The great statement from Joseph Smith about the banner of truth going forth nobly, boldly, and independent. But remember how it begins? No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. And I believe that. As a student of anti-Mormonism, I am completely convinced that no unhallowed hand can stop the work. But the irony then is, what about hallowed hands? Could hallowed hands stop the work from progressing? I remember when I first got to Tennessee, I was so overwhelmed with the amount of work that I felt like needed to be done. Uh, and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and so I knew I kept messing things up. But, I, but I, that statement always reassured me. As I'd say, Heavenly Father, if no unhallowed hand can stop the work, then I'm sure I'm not messing things up too dramatically. Since my, at least I don't have unhallowed hands. At least I'm trying to help. But here's the irony. Is it possible for hallowed hands to stop the work from progressing? Well, if those hands are supposed to be doing the work and they cease, then yeah, I guess hallowed hands, if unengaged in the work, then of course the work will stop progressing. Nobody's moving it forward. Now do you see why those who attack the church are trying to convince members the hallowed hands to stop contributing, to stop participating. It's the, the challenge of people leaving the church and leaving portions of the wall uncompleted. It's the challenge of people in the church just not wanting to 
have to face the mocking jeers if I have to show up to work again, for work again. It's the concern that they have of the amount of debris in their lives they'll have to clear out if they'll really make a difference. It's the members who are struggling with the, the burden that they're bearing and the strength that has decayed. It's members that are too concerned about the, the laughter of enemies and former friends. And, and that's the problem that we're up against. God will bring our enemies to naught. What I'm worried about is, is us doing naught ourselves, doing nothing. Now keep reading, verse 16, It came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergeons, that's armor, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. So they are taking the threats of these armies outside seriously. Uh, maybe they weren't bluffing all ten times. Maybe they are really planning an attack. And if people are concerned by, about those enemies, then yes, someone will have to face them. But not everyone. Some people need to be fully engaged in the work, while other people can be more engaged in protecting those that are engaged in the work. I sometimes think about apostles, for example, that, uh, example that are attacked or slandered. And the church as a whole typically doesn't stand up to defend itself. They just walk such things beneath their feet, to borrow a phrase from Joseph Smith. They let it just roll off them. And despite negative portrayals of the church in the media, for example, sometimes church public affairs will ask for more fairness in media representations. But for the most part, there's not some oh, memo from President Nelson telling us all of the, the historical problems in Hulu's depiction of Under the Banner of Heaven, <laughs> okay? Uh, when the Book of Mormon musical came out, realizing it was just mockery, okay, fine, we'll, we'll join in the fun and we'll take out an ad in the playbill and say, okay, you saw the musical, now read the actual book, will you? The book is always better. That's definitely the case with the Book of Mormon. But what's interesting, I am grateful, as I'm grateful for both. I'm grateful that the church decides, nope, we're just here to build faith and perform the Lord's work. And we don't have time to answer every, every hoot and sneer. Okay? We're just moving forward. I'm grateful for that, that the church uh, takes that approach institutionally. But I'm also grateful for some of the auxiliary organizations, if we want to call it that, Actually, auxiliary, has, that's already taken by, <laughs> by the Relief Society and Sunday School and Young Men and Young Women and so on. So uh, affiliated organizations, is that one step, further step removed? But there are groups out there like, like FAIR, which is a wonderful website that helps people navigate some of their questions about church history or doctrine and so on. I'm grateful for groups like Faith Matters that has, has incredible scholars and guests that come on and and explain controversial topics and, and matters of faith, hence the name, Faith Matters. I'm grateful for, oh, the, the Maxwell Institute that comes down through BYU. I'm grateful for the Interpreter Foundation. I'm grateful for just good individual Latter-day Saints that are trying to, to answer the call to defend the faith. I, I'm grateful for <laughs> fellow YouTubers that have come follow me channels and they're trying to instill faith in, in, in people who, need, who, are, who are looking for help. And I'm grateful to be involved in my little way myself. Because yes, there are times we need to build and there are times we need to defend. In fact, sometimes it's not just separate people. Sometimes it's just separate hands. You see that next. In verse 17, they which build it on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side and so builded. You've perhaps heard the phrase trowel in one hand and pistol in the other or sword in the other. Take your pick as far as your military technology is concerned. This is building and defending simultaneously. The, to have the, the sword girded by your side, remember sword of the spirit and the word, that always ought to be at the ready. But to get to a point where, I mean, it's like patting your head and rubbing your belly. Can I do both of those simultaneously? 
Can I build with one hand and defend with the other? Actually, I don't know of a better way to do it because nothing motivates you to defend quite like being engaged in the building of the kingdom. You realize that you have something worth defending and so you do it. And vice versa too. When you're defending something, you do recognize its value and the sacrifice that goes into that makes you all the more willing to keep up the work. Now, this doesn't have to become contentious. I pray that it doesn't. I hope we never have to use the, the sword in an attack kind of way. I would simply prefer using the sword of the Spirit to reassure me and protect me from their blows. It's amazing what a sword can do by, by way of defense, not just offense. But either way, it needs to be at the ready. We saw a similar thing happen, by the way, in church history with the construction of the Kirtland Temple, where it was trowel in one hand and, and pistol in the other, trying to overcome opposition even as they were building the house of God. One other detail in verse 19 and 20. I said unto the nobles, to the rulers, to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. Again, it's a fairly large city. We have a, a wall to go around the whole thing. And we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. So what are we going to do? In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. Now, logistically, that's absolutely essential in a project of this magnitude. Yes, we're all lifting where, we're, where we stand. And yes, we, this group works next to this group and next to that one. But there can be some distance between. And if I have finished my part of the wall and now I'm going to go over to take another portion, then that leaves my other part built but unprotected if I'm no longer there. So what are we going to do? Well, it's going to be all hands on deck. And if the enemy, I mean, we can't defend everywhere, but neither can the enemy attack everywhere. So wherever the enemy chooses to attack, then come rushing. If there's watchmen up on the wall and they see them gathering in a certain weak spot and they blow the trumpet, then turn the weak spot into a strong one. Captain Marone, I did that too. If you realize that people are attacking the family and the prophets make a proclamation to the world, then come rushing in defense of that doctrine. Whatever else the prophets are, are calling us to, when you hear the trumpet blast, then resort thither. We'll be fighting for the Lord, and thankfully the Lord will be fighting for us. This is a worldwide church with so many facets and so many oh, areas of life uh, and, and ge geographical areas, we can't do everything all the time for everyone. But when a need arises, we can come running. And Latter-day Saints typically do. Even if you listen to President Nelson now, what is the rallying cry? What area of the wall should we be rushing to? the gathering of Israel on both sides of the veil. Oh, letting God prevail in our lives by being engaged in that work of gathering. Oh, if you haven't heard that trumpet blast, we haven't been listening hard. Then the chapter ends, verse 22 and 3. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem. So say inside the city. It'll be the safest place for us, even when the walls aren't completely built that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. Stay as close to the site of work as possible. We don't want commuting here, okay? So stay right here within our city walls, incomplete as they might be. At night, let's guard one another. At day, let's work alongside one another. And then he says, So neither I nor my brother nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me None of us put off our clothes, saving that every one put them off for washing. Now, I don't know about personal hygiene here, especially if they're sweating on the city walls during their day, but they didn't even have time to change their clothing. Sounds like they're not just working with a sword in hand, but they're sleeping with one always at the ready also. And not even taking time to change their clothing, unless it got to the point where, yep, that one's absolutely in need of washing. So go take care of that. You're off wall duty. You're at wash duty, please. Well, you might be scaring the enemy away by your, sm by your smell. But more metaphorically, don't take off the garment of the holy priesthood. Don't remove your robes of righteousness. Be always 
clothed with that coat of skins meant to cover our nakedness and make sure the atonement is covering you. Wear and bear the holy priesthood and do it well because there's a fight afoot. Now, chapter 5, there's more to this story. They're still in the midst of all of this reconstruction. There's also been some famine in the land, which always seems to be a problem there. And as a result, many of the people there in Jerusalem are heavily in debt. They've been offering and sacrificing and working and serving and defending and (laughs) barely washing clothes and doing everything they can to build up these city walls. And economically, they are suffering as a result. Now, but we talked about rulers and nobles and princes, and yep, that's the problem. Not everyone is suffering to the same degree. And unfortunately, what's happening is they are oh, loaning money to the poor to get by, but they are charging interest to the point that those poor will never be able to repay us. And that's fine, because that way we'll get them and their ongoing labor. How about indentured servitude? Well, Nehemiah finds out about this that it's happening in Jerusalem, and he is furious and frustrated. He rebukes the nobles for doing this. Remember when when we talked about being gathered as one man, and I let you know that Zion would be defined by its unity, one heart, one mind, but also by its righteousness. That sounds like Ezra calling people to repentance and them doing it with godly sorrow. But the other, there was no poor among them. Well, here we see that's a weakness among the Jews in Jerusalem. There are poor among us, and they're only getting poorer as a result of our lack of unity. We're not treating them like ourselves. We're not treating them like brothers. We're treating them like slaves, and we know what that's like. Don't forget Egypt here. So as Nehemiah rebukes them, he says in verse 8, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren... Or shall they be sold unto us? You understand what you're doing? We have freed our own people from their enemies only to let them fall prey to our friends, to ourselves. What do you think you're doing? Selling your own flesh and blood. Their response? They held their peace and found nothing to answer. How's that for being shamed into silence because of your greed? Your unfair economic practices. You already had the advantage and then you took more and more advantage of your brethren. That is unfair. It's unjust. It's unmerciful. You can't do that. And so in verse 10, he says, I pray you, let us leave off this usury. So don't charge debt. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their oliveyards, their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, the corn, the wine, the oil that you exact of them. So not just stop charging interest. Give back what you fleeced from them. And then they said, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. I'm so relieved that they listened that they replace their pride with humility and replace their, good, their, their greed with goodness. We'll do it. And we're sorry that, that you had to command us to. This is a jubilee year. It came early. And we are freeing the poor from their economic bondage. Getting a little step closer to Zion, aren't we? In verse 14, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, and that's what's happening for Nehemiah. He was a cupbearer back in in Shushan, the capital of Persia. Now he is a governor in Judea. It lasted from the 20th year even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king. That is 12 years. I'm sure that's a lot longer than what he originally asked for, but he realized, yep, I need to be here for the long haul. But he says, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. So previous governors may have taken their pay from the people, but I didn't. Verse 15, so did not I because of the fear of the Lord. It wasn't just out of concern for you. It was concern for my relationship with God. This actually sounds a lot like King Benjamin, a Book of Mormon, Nehemiah of sorts. I'm not going to take my rightful allowance from the people. I'm not going to tax you or burden you. I will serve right alongside you. 
I will lift where I stand and I will have a clear conscience before God as a result. After all, I am only in the service of him when I'm in the service of my fellow beings. And he would be. Verse 16, Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall. Yeah, working right alongside. Neither bought we any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. I'm not above it, even though some of the rulers wouldn't put their neck out for it. Instead, Nehemiah works himself, just like King Benjamin had. He has a local government to run, and yes, that does include expenses, but he never overtaxes the people to do it. In verse 18 and 19, Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. I, I'm not going to add any other burden to you. So then he prays, as chapter 5 concludes, Think upon me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. There's yet one more echo of King Benjamin. I can go to God with a clear conscience. Lord, think of me. I have tried to do good. Well, not everyone is trying to do good. You still have opposition. The bells of hell are still ringing all around. And so in Nehemiah 6, here's more opposition. And yet more <laughs> continuation, enduring it well, on the part of the Israelites. The Jews' enemies have learned that the wall is getting closer and closer to being finished. And they send a message to Nehemiah saying in verse 2, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And thankfully, Nehemiah was wise enough to see through that. This was like what we saw in Ezra when the Samaritans come and go, Oh, can we help? as wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, your help would be hindrance, so you have no part or portion here. If you're what, you can go. We got this covered. Uh, Nehemiah is equally wise. And so, no, I'm not going to join you down in the plains of Ono. Oh in fact, I love the name. I used to tell my seminary students they, that Nehemiah said, Oh, no, to Ono. Oh, no. And we have to learn to do likewise. Remember what he's tried before. They tried open mockery. They've tried to get the political powers against them. They've tried to dissuade them in any kind of way. This one is a matter of not destroying or dissuading. Rather, it's a matter of distracting and diverting. Oh, you're building your wall. Oh, congratulations. It looks, it looks fox-worthy by now. Uh, it's not going to get knocked over. Uh, but why don't you come down to our level? You're up in Jerusalem. Why don't you come down to the plain of Oh No? Uh, we've got some other th uh, things we could be doing. There's a great quote from Elder Maxwell, by the way, who said that many individuals preoccupied by the cares of the world are not necessarily in transgression, but they certainly are in diversion and thus waste the days of their probation. That's what I get a sense of in chapter 6, verse 2. They're trying to do me mischief. And so much of the diversions and distractions of the world are pretty mischievous. And I might not be doing anything horribly wrong, but I'm occupied in things that are keeping me from doing anything really right. If he can't get us with sins of commission, then you better believe the adversary is going to try to get us with sins of omission. And you better say, oh no, to all that. That's what Nehemiah does. Verse 3, I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort. There's persistence on their part. And I answered them after the same manner. So equal persistence on Nehemiah's part. I'm far too busy building the kingdom to come down and be distracted in the plains of Ono. The view from the mountaintop is so breathtaking. I'm not going to descend to the plain. Elder Uchtdorf was the one who gave us that phrase, lift where you stand. He also gave us a talk based on this passage about doing a great work so that we cannot come down to lesser endeavors. That's a talk worth rereading. And it is amazing how much easier it is to resist temptation when we are anxiously engaged in the work of God. When we're at higher levels, we tend not to descend. And that's what's happening here. The, Jew, the Jews' adversaries, however, try to coerce Nehemiah into stopping the work. This time they do it by threatening to raise false accusations against him. 
we're going to tell the kings of per the king of Persia, your old boss, your 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 current boss as well, that you're trying to prepare to to be traitors to the crown. You're you're planning a rebellion. That's why you're building the wall. Oh yeah, that this will be good evidence even. Why do you need a wall unless there's something you're trying to hide behind? Why? Oh, this will be perfect. So you better stop the work or we'll tell the king lies about what this work is meant to accomplish. Well, that doesn't work either. In verse 8, Nehemiah responds, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. This is complete fabrication. You're feigning, faking this. There's no rebellion in my heart. There's only <laughs> hypocrisy in yours. And I think my king will know me well enough to see through that. So I'm not intimidated. You can't blackmail me or coerce me into this. We've talked about half-truths that sometimes come up in historical treatments of the church. But what's fascinating is some straight-out lies and, and falsehoods that are thrown out there as well. So much of that was, was things said about Joseph Smith in the early, in his, during his time period. Uh, Danite kinds of things where there's no evidence of anyone acting on any kind of the charged rhetoric from the Mormon Reformation. Are you, are you serious? Uh, I actually saw something. This was fascinating to me because I was the target of an anti-Mormon attack. I guess that's when I knew I arrived. Like, okay, wow, they're even attacking me now. I, who am I? I'm nobody. But it was interesting in a comment section uh, from a, an anti-Jared Halverson video, which... Take it for whatever it's worth. But in the comment section, one commenter, yes, I have thick enough skin to watch the things that attack me and to read the comments against me. But this one said that he had come to see me to ask questions about the church. Now, that happens all the time. So I assume, okay, who is this person? I'm looking at the name. And, but the way he was describing it was like, this just happened on Sunday. And then Monday I went and I met with him. And he, was, he avoided every hard question I had. I'm like, I didn't meet anyone on Sunday or Monday this week. I, this, who are you? And then he went on and described the conversation that supposedly we had. And it was things like, oh, it got so contentious that he threw me out of the office, threw me out of his office because he didn't want to go down that, that path. And, and I was sitting there going, I've never thrown anyone out of my office. I would never dream of that. In fact, I wouldn't dream of getting contentious. I have enough of these conversations to know that contentions of the devil and it does no one any good. So there's no bashing. There's no me, me trying to force anyone to believe. It's not even me trying to prove anything because I would prefer the spirit to do that work. I, I believe in the power of faith, not just of, of reason to convince. And so I just read this thinking, this is absolute fabrication. It was one of the few times I actually had to, to speak up to defend myself. And so I made a comment back to, say, to, the, to the person. I just said, I, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, you might be mistaking me for someone else because this experience, at least I was never a part of. Uh, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But it's amazing to me to see that there are those out there that would stoop to those kinds of levels of feigning things out of their own hearts because there's no such thing as what they say. Again, we can be trusting, but we need to be careful and wise as well. We'll go on. Nehemiah knows what they're trying to do. And he says in verse 9, For they all made us afraid. At least that's what they were hoping to do, to intimidate us. Saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. So what's he do? He prays. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. That should be our prayer as well. God, please help me know the falsehoods that are being thrown in my face. Help me think my way through the misinformation. Help me heed not the mocking jeers. Please strengthen my hands against those that would weaken the work. And help me stay engaged in it, trowel in one hand and sword in the other. Lord, please strengthen me because the work must not slack. I cannot weaken my resolve or slow down my service. Please give me the strength to push forward. And he will. 
He always has for me. There's a priest there who worries about Nehemiah's safety in the face of all these threats that keep coming ten times and, and beyond. So he makes a suggestion to Nehemiah that he hide himself inside the temple for protection. The walls aren't completely done, but the temple is a, a sanctuary, and you can go hide there and no one will be able to get you. But Nehemiah's response in verse 11 is so full of faith. He says, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that, being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. That level of cowardice is beneath me. But also, that place of holiness is above me. I'm a leader, so I won't do that. But I'm also not a Levite, so I won't do that. Either way, what, what are you trying to get me to do? Set a negative example to the people that cowardice is okay? And I'm going to go run and hide? No, I won't do that. Or also, the other hand, am I set, are you trying to get me to set a negative example of, of unworthiness, of unholiness? Because I can't do that either. In verse 12, he says, Lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. There's more discernment on his part. He knew that God wouldn't have given such counsel through this so-called man of God. But he pronounced this prophecy against me. For Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired, that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. And there's one more strategy to add to our list. This person was hired? This is an insider on the outsider's payroll? This is a current member serving the former member uh, who's still on the inn? I've heard of sometimes that happening in congregations, too. And people trying to hijack the pulpit on fast and testimony meeting. Or, again, it's a real war with real casualties. It's an interesting fight out there. But in this one, to hire someone to tempt Nehemiah to lower his standard. Again, either to show cowardice or to show some kind of presumption that even though I'm not a Levite, I can go into the house of God. I worry about those that are seeking ways to create an evil report so that you lose credibility. I can only imagine what the prophets and apostles are up against. As people try to make them an offender for a word or try to, to tempt them to become a negative example, just any kind of dirt they might be able to dig up to lower their credibility. Well, Nehemiah rejects all of this false counsel. He had the discernment to do so. And again, he prays for strength. My God, this is verse 14, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works. I'm just going to leave them in your hands. I'm not going to do anything against them myself. And, he adds, on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. These are false prophets, one and all. And one of them, at least my name, is female. We saw hold of the prophetess serving God well back in the reign of King Josiah. Here, Noadiah. Oh, I hope there's not many Noadiahs out there. Well, you don't want, don't want to name your daughter after this false prophetess that's trying to put a man of God in fear. And yet do some turn to the false prophets of the world, the celebrities and influencers, trying to convince them that the things of God are not worth holding on to. Well, despite all this, verse 15 the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elul in 50 and 2 days. And that's a miracle. To <laughs> rebuild a wall despite all the, the rubble and de debris, despite of the, the weakened backs of people that were laboring so diligently under the burdens, despite all the opposition from outside and even opposition that had worked its way within. 52 days, less than two months. Remember when they mocked them? You really think you can do this in one day? It's like, no, but give me 51 extras, and I bet I can get this thing done. <laughs> Whatever. You and your fox building. Uh, it's amazing to see how fast God's work can be done if we have a mind to the labor. If we'll lift where we stand. If we'll come to the trumpet's call. If we won't get dissuaded or deterred and don't get distracted or diverted. If we'll say, oh no, to oh no, and we'll pray to God for the strength we need to heed not the mockings and jeers of those around us, 
we can encircle the kingdom of God with strength, just as Nehemiah did. And in verse 16, it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, this 52-day miracle, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Nehemiah is always giving God the credit. He's always turning to God for strength. He's leaving things in God's hands, and God is good for it. Nehemiah knows it. It was, work, it was a work wrought by him. You think we could pull this off in 52 days? No, not at all. But a God who can make heaven and earth in six? Oh yeah, a city wall in 52? Piece of cake. And I love that even those around them, enemies, can't deny it. It's right in front of them. Let your service speak for itself. Fight opposition with faith. Just keep building the kingdom and let the chips fall where they may. Now, chapter 7 is another one of those long list chapters. And you can fly through it. It's mostly genealogical. A uh, few verses worth highlighting, though. Verse 1 and 2. It came to pass when the wall was built, now that it's behind us, and I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem. For he was a faithful man and feared God above, above many. That's just the type of person that can be trusted to assist you. And Nehemiah is turning to him to do so. Verse 4, Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not builded. At least they weren't built to the level of population density of Jerusalem before the Babylonian attack. Uh, for some, that's the place that always seems to get destroyed. I mean, it's the center of attention. So I think I'd rather live uh, in the suburbs. How's that? But that's going to be a challenge. We need people within the city walls to be able to help the house of God function, uh, to be able to build up the city itself. And so we're going to need to do a little bit more home construction right there within the city in hopes that people, if we build it, people will come. It's actually a good sign, in my opinion, that they put the temple first, and then they put the walls second, and then they put the houses third uh, in terms of their own personal comfort or their own personal safety. Once I have a purpose, temple, and once I have an identity, walls, then how I live will just fall into place. It'll be okay, but that can be a third priority. In verse 5, And my God put into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. We've been so hard at work on the where and on the what, we don't want to lose sight of the who. So just as genealogies were taken back in, the, in Ezra's book, genealogies are being taken here in Nehemiah as well. And the rest of the chapter then lists the names and the numbers of those families that returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. It even repeated what we saw in Ezra about those who couldn't find their genealogy and were therefore put from the priesthood. Again, this is a continuous narrative with a lot of overlap between Ezra and Nehemiah. But then you get, well, the ultimate overlap, because Ezra shows back up on the scene in Nehemiah chapter 8. And I've missed him. Uh, we haven't seen him in the book of Nehemiah yet. And some suggest that he either went back to Babylon, or excuse me, back to Shushan, capital of Persia, for whatever reason, that he'd come to, he led the people in that second wave, he reestablished the law, he showed them godly sorrow and and help them work, sort things out as far as their marriages outside the covenant. But then he went back to, to Persia, perhaps to help rally the next round of remnant, uh, whatever it might be. Others suggest, other scholars suggest, well, maybe he stayed in Jerusalem all this time, but he had done his, his work and thought it was done. And maybe now it's only with the, the completion of the wall and a, now, a new sense of self that he comes out to do another round of reformation. Uh, we just don't know because the, uh, the account doesn't give it to us. But we do see him back on the scene in Nehemiah chapter 8. Verse 1, All the people gathered themselves together as one man, there's the unity in Zion again, into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. He probably didn't have to bring the book. He probably had the whole thing memorized, <laughs> knowing Ezra, this ready scribe. He knew it. He was Moses 2.0. But what, he, what does he do when he comes? Verse 2, 
Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women. We need everyone to hear it. In fact, unto all that could hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday. Yeah, it's going to take a while to read all of that. You thought my lessons were long? Uh, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. He's come to reconfirm the covenant. He's here to reiterate the law of God. And it's all ears and all eyes on him. They are attentive to the law, as we all must be. In verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people probably on a pulpit built for that purpose, kind of like King Benjamin on his tower. This is, you could say the same thing spiritually, by the way. Yes, he was above them in his understanding of the law, but he's teaching them. When he opened it, all the people stood up. You see them rising to a higher level with his influence. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is one of those verses that I love thinking about from my own experience as far as was there ever anyone that was above me, spiritually speaking, that opened the book in my sight and by doing so I was so moved to rise, to stand a little taller and, and be a little better and spend more time in the scriptures than I ever had before. There was someone like that for me, and his name, in fact, was Ezra. Ezra Taft Benson dusted off the voice from the dust, which is the Book of Mormon. When people ask, What's your, who's your favorite Book of Mormon prophet? And they're thinking Nephi or Captain Moroni or, or Mormon or anyone else. I love those guys too, but Ezra Taft Benson is still one of my absolute favorite Book of Mormon prophets because he's the one that convinced me that every other Book of Mormon prophet was worth spending a lifetime with. I will forever be grateful to have grown up in the days where he emphasized the Book of Mormon every chance he could, that he opened the book in the sight of all the people. Are we still opening the book <laughs> in our own sight and spending as much time in it as Ezra wanted us to? In verse 7, those who were serving with Ezra caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. I love those verses too because that's a teacher's job. That's, I guess I could have said that to my kids. What does daddy do at work? Oh, I, I read the, the words of the law distinctly. I want my students to understand it, so I give the sense. I want them to be able to live it, so I make sure they understand the reading. And hopefully that's what we're doing here in these lessons. If we can understand God's Word sufficiently, if it makes sense to us, I'm convinced that there's nothing that would keep us from wanting to live it. I think this is the best advice that's ever been given in the history of humanity. And if we can simply come to understand God's Word and how it applies in our own lives, then we'll live the way God wants us to. I have a testimony of that, and I'm, I'm spending my life trying to back that up. I would be honored to be numbered among those who served alongside Ezra, who are doing exactly that. In verse 9, and Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, the governor, and Ezra, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, they all said to all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Now this is an odd verse. In fact, add it to verse 10. He said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, wait a minute. I thought you said Ezra was like the poster boy for godly sorrow. Well, yeah, he is. Then what on earth is he doing eating the fat and drinking the sweet? Why are they rejoicing when they're reiterating the law and reconfirming the covenant? People aren't living it perfectly. Oh, I know. 
But if godly sorrow has served its purpose, you don't have to wallow in despair for the rest of your life, proving that you really meant it, how bad you felt for your sin. It's one, it's a problem to not take sin seriously, and therefore godly sorrow is required. But I don't know if I'd call it a sin, but it sure is ungrateful not to take forgiveness equally seriously. And if you do, your godly sorrow turns into godly joy. And that's what they're, they're emphasizing here. Yes, we are reiterating the law. And yes, there's repentance that still is required of each of us. But do you not see that God gave us a nail in his holy place? That he's given us a little reviving in our bondage? That he's punished us less than our iniquities deserve? That he's, he's strengthened us? He's given us a temple again. He's rebuilt the walls around us. He's preserved his people and redefined us as peculiarly his. <laughs> What's there not to rejoice over? Can you pass some more fat? <laughs> Can you bring pour a little more sweet? Because it's a time to rejoice. And the people did. They celebrated once again the Feast of Tabernacles. And they did it like never before. Oh, our wilderness wanderings are over and we've been brought back into a promised land that God has rebuilt right before our eyes. And that is cause for rejoicing. In chapter 9, then, we see a prayer. A prayer of praise, a prayer of gratitude. It's one of my favorite prayers in the Old Testament. Uh, it's, a, it's a psalm of sorts. And what I love about it is that it's historical. And it's not just the historical geek in me that is loving this review of Israelite history, but it's the details we see about God's hand running through that history. Keep an eye out for it, and you'll see what these Israelites are emphasizing as they review their sacred past. In verse 1, in the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them, all signs of mourning. Yes, there is still cause to repent, godly sorrow mingled with their godly joy. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. We are trying to renew our, how serious we are about this covenant. We're separating ourselves from foreign influence, confessing our sins before all. Verse 3, they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and then another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. This sounds like a long day of church. Uh, fourth part, if it's a 12-hour day and a fourth part is three hours, we don't even do three-hour church anymore. And yet they did a three-hour church session just for reading the scriptures, and then a three-hour church session just to confess their sins and worship God. I think the order is beautiful, by the way. If you study the word... Of course, it will bring you down to the depths of repentance because you see where you fall short. But as you repent, it will lead to your forgiveness, which will then lead to your praise because of the forgiveness that has come. Well, that praise is going to appear in the prayer that follows. And it's so beautiful. Verse 5, the Levites say to the people, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And, and here's how they're going to do it. Blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Exalted above it? That means that no matter how high we raise our praise to God, he's still above it. Not even our loftiest language can hope to approach him. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worship thee. Can we join them in that worship? God, thou art the creator of heaven and earth. Thou art the source of every spiritual and temporal blessing. And now that we've put thee at the forefront of all of this, may we walk through our history looking for the evidence of thy kindness because that's what they're looking for. People who say the Old Testament is nothing but God's justice and anger and wrath, I wonder when the last time was they really read it carefully. 
And this is one of those examples where if you look at Israelite history, you see God's compassion shining through. They did. Notice what they emphasize. Verse 7, Thou art the Lord, the God, who didst choose Abram, and brought him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee. I love that phrase about Father Abraham. He had a faithful heart. God saw that in him, and that's why he chose him. And thou madest a covenant with him to bring the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Girgashites, to give it, I say, to his seed. And hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. It's one thing to see what God has done. It's another thing to recognize why God has done it. And the way this prayer is, is rolling forth, it's centered in the attributes of deity. We know what God is like, and that's what's driving what God has done. Why did he make this covenant? And more importantly, why did he keep it? Because he's righteous. He can be completely trusted. Unreserved faith. He deserves it because of that righteousness. Verse 9, And didst see the afflictions of our fathers in Egypt, and heardest their cry by the Red Sea, and showest signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and all his servants, and on all the people of the land, for thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So didst thou get thee a name as it is this day. Interesting phrase. That's how you got your name? Now, he already had his name. I am that I am. He'd introduced himself to Moses. But for the rest of the world, remember Pharaoh's concern? I don't know this God. And we got plenty of gods. I got a whole phone book here in, in, in Egypt. But Jehovah? Yeah, I never heard of him. Well, yeah, kind of new name for most of us. But you'll, <laughs> the world will know him. And through his divine attributes, through his miraculous actions, the world did come to know him. Now the prayer continues and they review the crossing of the Red Sea, the cloud of smoke, the pillar of fire that brought them all the way to Sinai. Then in verse 13, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. The adjectives there are beautiful. You see so many verses that speak of God's judgments and laws and statutes and commandments. But the way this prayer describes them, the adjectives, those judgments, he wasn't flipping a coin and just kind of going with the gut. No, those were right judgments. The laws, <laughs> not restrictive, no, that's not the adjective I would use. True, how's that? Statutes and commandments, they were all good and would have made us good if we had followed them. But we didn't always. And that's where the next part of the history lesson goes. As they go through their wilderness wanderings and murmuring after murmuring, past the manna, past the water from the rock, onto their rebellions in the wilderness, where he says in verse 17, But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and forsookest them not. They made a golden calf, but in verse 19, Thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night, to show them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. You see everything that they're mentioning about the attributes of God. I think it was Elder Maxwell who once said, there is no atonement absent the character of Christ. It's, it's who he is, not just what he did. And that's what I see flowing throughout this magnificent prayer. It's not just what God did for us all those years. It's what he is that motivated him to do so. Ready to pardon, and we gave him plenty of chances to do it. Gracious and merciful, so much evidence. Slow to anger, he got there because we pushed him. But he was always trying to help us. And he never forsook us, even though we continually forsook him. You want to talk about manifold mercies. You'd be blind not to see it in these pages. The history lesson keeps going through more wilderness wanderings, all the way beyond the conquest of Canaan, 
In verse 25, he describes that in these terms. They took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, wells digged, vineyards, olive years, fruit trees in abundance. Is this reminding you of Moses' preliminary warning? A land for which you did not labor, wells you didn't dig, and houses you didn't build. Beware lest ye forget the Lord. Well, they did end up forgetting, but God never forgot them. He goes on, they did eat, they were filled, they became fat, and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. But unfortunately, they ended up not remembering its source. Goodness personified. And so they continued to rebel. They were delivered up into the hands of their enemies during the period of the judges. And in verse 27, in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. That verse summarizes the book of Judges perfectly. The pride cycle with all of its wicked rounds, but also its manifold mercies, as God kept calling, not just judge after judge, but sending savior after savior. Well, after round and round of the, the pride cycle, verse 28, yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. They continued to rebel, but in verse 30, Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Another example of his mercy, sending messengers to call us home. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them unto the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, Thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. It's the only reason any of us are left standing. This little righteous remnant, not even righteous, but less wicked remnant that is returning. It's because of God's grace and mercy. It's who he is. In verse 32, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. I love that verse because it's describing God in such lofty terms that no wonder it has to describe their mortal sufferings and troubles as minuscule. But he prays, let not our troubles, the things we've been through with the the destruction of the northern and southern kingdoms and all the Assyrians and the Babylonians and all we've had to face, don't let that seem little before thee. Because if it's little, then you won't care. And you're so big that you can't help but see our, our sufferings in perspective for the momentary trials that they are the tiny little troubles that we go through. But that's the irony, again, based on the goodness of God, based on the condescension of Christ. He came down so that our troubles wouldn't see, seem so little from a distance. He wanted to feel them and experience them up close and personal until they loomed larger and larger, enough for even a God to want to save us from. I love that verse. This is the infinite, not wanting to let that infinite in eclipse the intimate. Your troubles aren't little. If they're big to you, then they're big to me, because you're not little in my sight. He then says in verse, or they then pray in verse 33, Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. The, these troubles, not so tiny from our perspective. I know that they're our fault. I know that we brought them upon ourselves. You did right. We did wrong. And so you're just in letting us suffer through them. But I'm thankful that thou art merciful as well to give us that reviving we need. And thus the prayer concludes. With all the suffering they've endured under the Assyrians and the Babylonians and somewhat under the Persians, verse 37 and 38, we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. 
the ending of this prayer is fascinating. It's because of all we've been through and because of who we know thee to be throughout all of that history that we want to bind ourselves to thee. We want to seal the covenant and that covenant is a relationship with God. We do want to be thy covenant people, thy peculiar people, chosen by thee, because no one else will have us. We would, we would have offended any other God that was any less compassionate and merciful than thou art. A great ending. And the way chapter 9 ends is the way chapter 10 begins, as that covenant is sealed, just like they asked. Verse 1, now those that sealed... Those that sign their name on the line and put their seal to it, that yes, I want to covenant along those lines. Those that sealed were Nehemiah, the Tershatha. And the list goes on and on from there. But who was mentioned first? Nehemiah himself. I love that about him. He's not asking them to make a covenant. He's not willing to make himself. And, the, and he, here's the John Hancock on the declaration. The biggest... Uh, we don't know if he was the first to sign, but he was the biggest to sign. I want to make sure that King George can see this without his glasses on. Well, Nehemiah, I will rush in and make sure that my people know that I'm a leader worth following because God is a God worth covenanting with. Nehemiah knows it. Well, the list is long, but by the time you get to verse 28, the rest of the people, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, so a certain level of accountability is required to be able to know what covenant you're making, they clave to their brethren. Their nobles are the ones leading the way and entering into the covenant. It's about time that they, they step up. They entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. Interesting that both of those halves of the whole would be listed, both the curse for disobedience and the oath which is promising that we won't be disobedient. There's blessings and curses all rolled into one. Here's life and death, so choose life. And then the rest of this chapter describes the covenant that they are specifically entering into. It's going to include a promise not to marry outside the covenant. Ezra knows the problems of that one well. It's going to include a promise to keep the Sabbath day holy. And it's going to include a promise to bring their tithes into the temple so that the poor can be provided for, so that the offerings can be made to God. We are trying to be a covenant Zion people after all, and all of this will be required of us. You can sum the whole thing up in verse 39. The covenant was that we will not forsake the house of our God. It's the center of our city. It's behind our protective walls. It defines who we are and what we're about. And so we will never forsake it. Chapter 11, then, let's bring people home. The city's ready. They can be safe behind our protective walls. And in verse 1, the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. One in ten, there's our tenth, there's our tithe. Let's give it to the Lord. Let's bring it to His holy city and have people live there. Now you'd think that you wouldn't need some kind of uh, lottery system casting lots to find that lucky one in ten. Well, maybe that's why it's the lottery system. Everybody wants it. Uh, and sorry, there's not enough room. We still have more houses to build and increase the population density, but we want to cover the whole land and repopulate Judah and Israel, not just the city of Jerusalem. But that's what confuses me about that last line. They blessed those who willingly offered themselves to dwell. Uh, so was the one in ten, the lot casting? I'm sorry, you have to move into Jerusalem. We need more people. Some were willing to go, and blessed be you for, for doing it. What would keep anybody from wanting to live in Jerusalem? Well, the fact that it needs a wall might be a problem. It's like when you see people with, you know, they have security everywhere and iron bars, and you're like, wow, that's a really safe place to live. And you're like, wait a minute. The fact they need security and iron bars might mean it's not exactly a safe place to live. Or the idea of... Jerusalem is the center of it all, and I don't know if I can handle being in the middle of all of that. 
oh, can I just live on the periphery of the kingdom and settle some other remote village so God doesn't call on me so often? Well, blessed are those that are willing to, to step into the center of things and try to make a difference. And hopefully that's more than one in ten of us. Well, the chiefs of all those who dwell, dwell in Jerusalem are then listed throughout chapter 11. And they're described as valiant men in verse 6, or mighty men of valor in verse 14. And then the chapter goes through and describes those other villages that are being repopulated. And thus ends chapter 11. Chapter 12 is another quick one to just kind of skim over. Here you have chief priests and Levites who return to Jerusalem from Babylon. They're listed, they're given their responsibilities, which include things like singing of praises and giving of thanks. That's always important. Verse 43 tells us, Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. That to me is the one most important verse of Nehemiah chapter 12 because it tells us the attitude that is expected of all who are building the kingdom of God. It's one of rejoicing. Sherry Dew once said that, man, you hear people talk about life in the church and it sounds like life on the chain gang. It's like, come on, uh, life is what's hard, not the gospel. The gospel makes hard life worth living. So as you're here in the city of, of Zion, rejoice. Men are that they might have joy. Let, let your face know it and show it. And then we get to chapter 13, which is the end of our study. In Nehemiah 13, verse 1, on that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. We've seen a lot of that happen. And when you got Ezra in the lead, of course you're going to get a lot of that. And therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Well, why? Why would they be cut off? Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water but hired Balaam, or Balaam as we call him, against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Interesting. There's been a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of time since Balaam and his talking donkey, way back in the book of Numbers. That's when they first came into the promised land. But what had the Ammonites and Moabites done? People that, again, were connected to the seed of Abraham through Lot, his posterity. Well, that's the problem. They didn't treat them like family. They didn't even come out with bread and water. Instead of helping, they tried to hinder. Oh, sound like the Samaritans as they were rebuilding Jerusalem? They didn't provide the normal hospitality that was expected of everyone. We are our brother's keepers. And yet you couldn't treat us that way. You hired a false prophet to try to call down the wrath of God upon us. We didn't need help with that, by the way. We did plenty of that ourselves, unfortunately. But we were punished as a result, and now you are punished as a result of that. At the end of the day, what matters most? How you feel about God and how you treat your fellow human being. And then the Ammonites and Moabites did not do well. The people of Judah then bring their tithes to the temple. Nehemiah appoints priests and Levites to distribute it unto their brethren. These are not just gifts for God, they're gifts for the people. After which Nehemiah says this in verse 14. And I love some of these final words of this great Tershatha, <laughs> this great governor. Verse 14, remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. Similar to what he had said earlier about God, think on me. Remember what I've been trying to do. I hope it's acceptable in thy sight. I hope it's sufficient for the missions thou hast given me. Nehemiah continues, he makes arrangements to more strictly observe the Sabbath day, which the people had been breaking, unfortunately. And again he says in verse 22, Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. I'm not asking you to remember this as if I were buying my salvation or earning heaven through my works righteousness. That's not it. I'm simply asking that you remember the feeble efforts that I am making out of my love for thee and that through the greatness of thy mercy, 
you'll remember it and spare me. Punish me less than my iniquities deserve. I'm not asking you to reward me according to my goodness, because it's not that good. Then it would be justice paying off a debt to me, and that's not what applies. It's mercy sparing me. Then others continue to marry outside the covenant, much to Nehemiah's dismay. Uh, Ezra would be frustrated here as well. He condemns them for their disobedience and says in verse 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Outlandish is probably the best definition you could think of because they came from out the land of Israel. Strange, they were called. Foreign, they were called. False, we could add, at least as far as their gods were concerned. And if they could lead away someone as wise as Solomon, you think you're going to fare any better? If, if they brought Solomon astray, you can't risk falling into the same temptations. You cannot afford to marry outside the covenant. But some did. And then the book ends with verse 30 and 31. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers, anyone who would repent anyway, and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone to his business, and for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits. Just trying to make sure that we finish this book on a good note, make sure everything's organized so that the, the Jews here in Jerusalem can endure to the end and righteousness can outlive my little reign here. But then he adds one last thought, which is so true to Nehemiah. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. That, my friends, is the prayer of every faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. I know that we have given thee so many things to remember us for evil. And yet, miraculously, as we turn to him in godly sorrow and offer our souls on the altar, he doesn't remember those things. I, the Lord, remember them no more. Which means all that's left in his memory is our goodness. <laughs> That's amazing. It's incredible that omniscience can, can choose to forget certain things and never bring them up. It, that he can whitewash our, our sins to the point of whitewashing his own memory. It's incredible, mer incredibly merciful of him but it allows him to remember us for good. Can we hope for that as we rebuild our lives? Trusting that God will forget our brokenness and just help us mend. If we will simply put the temple back in the center of our lives, if we will work to reconstruct the walls around us and define ourselves as his peculiar treasure, then of course God will remember us for good. Throughout all this work of reconstruction, the day will come where God can say to each of us, I remember you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I only remember thee for good. <laughs>